G'day, Dylan from the Byron Bay Observatory here. A few people have written to me over the years and told me, thank you, uh, you were the one who got me into astronomy in the first place, stumbling upon your videos, I've learned so much. And to you guys and your families, I just wanna say, I am so, so sorry. Um, this is not on me, this is all on you. You cannot blame me for what you've done to yourself. But apart from that, it's been a great year for astronomy. Like there is just so much going on right now. Did you know that spring is fireball season? There's an increase in shooting stars, meteorites, fireballs uh, by 30%. That's not an insignificant number. And actually there's no real explanation for this. Obviously we see more fireballs and meteorites when there is clear weather and it's definitely clearer around this time of year. But apparently even when they control for the weather, that doesn't explain the 30% increase. So there's more that we need to learn in science about things like that. And I love that science has things like that where science says, we don't know. You ever heard an astrologer say, I don't know? I didn't think so. Also comet 2023A3 that just went around the sun and is predicted to be a good one, potentially if this light curve holds, uh, should return to our skies soon. So fingers crossed. Planet season is now rolling around. Saturn just had its opposition. Jupiter and Mars are on the way. Uh, just a fantastic time of year. It's a solar maximum. The sun is still going berserk. And on top of all of that, it's eclipse season. If you want to know more about what's going on in space for you, I do recommend Sky Guide for iOS. It's an iPhone app, but it is well worth the subscription and even the free version works pretty damn well. But the reason I'm filming this video for you today is because I'm about to make some changes in the observatory. And to be honest, I've had a really, really good winter. I feel like my deep space astrophotography has sort of come up a peg uh, this year because of a number of things. But overall, it's because of the setup that I've got out there. But also I realized that I'm not a review channel per se. I don't compare equipment. There are lots of other channels that do that really well. But what I do like to share with you guys is the stuff that I recommend is just the stuff I use. So I want to take you out to the observatory and explain what all the hell that stuff is. So sit back, relax, open your favorite bottle of $20 to $50 red wine and let me, your best friend, show you some gear oh. pornography. My name is Dylan O'Donnell. And you're watching Star Stuff. So this is the observatory. Obviously it's very hard for me to film in here with this particular lens. I'd need like a fisheye. It's 2.4 meters across. Uh, my review of the next time. Honestly, it's pretty good once it's all set up. My main gripe is probably this battery here, uh, which is on the shutter. These little wire connectors get frayed and uh, kind of dodgy. Some better connectors here would be good. But there is a bit of a struggle hardware wise with maintenance. Obviously, it's got a lot of moving parts. You've got to keep it maintained. But waterproof wise, windproof wise, it's been amazing. Uh, I like it better than the Skyshed aperture here where it opens up like a slot rather than the clamshell. I think that's much better. If you're wondering how that's all connected, it actually has two connections. This is the main power box which powers the gear so you can make this go left and right. That's not switched on this second. And then it has the shutter itself. The shutter speaks wirelessly, so it's got its own little Arduino in here and separate power in there as well, so that when it opens up, it's obviously not connected to anything, but it has the power to come back down again and recharge itself off this charger. So the only real connection is the USB from here for the main controller, which will go down to the computer, and then the wireless communication with the shutter. Speaking of the computer, just a little sort of mini PC, a Dell PC. Uh, you could probably run this whole setup off something a lot smaller and I probably will go down that path eventually. But the Dell PC, like really good bang for buck. The mount is the Skywatcher EQ8RH Pro. Beautiful, beautiful mount. I've got to say, zero regrets with this mount. It is such a capable thing. And because it's Skywatcher, it has the EQ mod compatibility. Everything works via ASCOM. There is a little issue with the down, slowing down. Um, that button gets sticky. I don't know if it's a hardware or software problem, but sometimes you need to tap it a few times. Not an issue when you're controlling it via ASCOM. That just works. But just the size of this mount means it's gonna take basically anything I can afford to put on it. So the mount has a little power 
extender here and a hub which I put really just non-important stuff on like this light and the USB for the Dew controller as well. The Dew controller is really interesting, right? This is a Celestron product. So the Dew controller just hangs off the rail, which is beautiful, it's sort of out of the way of everything. And then it's connected to these wires up here, which then have the thermometer temperature sensor and the actual Dew ring. So the Dew ring is installed here. This is literally a ring around the whole glass, which will dry up any humidity uh, that you experience of a night time. And I found that to, to work really well. Uh, the only thing to note is don't overpower this, put it on a very conservative uh, power setting. Otherwise, if this is powering too much and making things too warm, you will get a glow spot in your data. You can't actually put the cover onto the telescope when the dew stuff's connected, so I just leave the dew shield on all the time. And I just gave that glass a bit of a clean because it looks nasty. Uh, it does live outside, so uh, it does get, you know, all the dirt and grime on there after a while. Dust settles on it. On top here, I've got some guide rings. I used to use this for a guide scope up here, but now I've found it's much more useful to put in a whole camera lens or a secondary telescope or something else. So when I don't want to use the big guy, which is not often, I can put a smaller telescope in here for some wide field stuff. This here is a finder scope. So this is purely visual. Let's go around. So if I'm hunting for planets, I'll use this finder scope to be able to center the telescope onto a target. And obviously this has to be aligned with the main scope to make sure it's looking at the same thing. You use these adjustment screws here to uh, get that alignment right. And that's really great for when you're doing planetary work because it's hard to go to a planet. Now let's look at the really fun end, the current image train for 2024. Okay, on the back, I've got the QHY268M camera, 16-bit CMOS, fantastic camera. I did switch to the 294M when this was out for repairs, and um, the, I really noticed that drop in bit depth. Uh, so really great camera, I thoroughly recommend it. I had a user who helped me print all of these little cable guiders. I wasn't really great with cable management beforehand, but these little guys have uh, really cleaned things up made things easy to route. This one's 3D printed as well. Now the QHY camera setup's a little bit interesting in that the uh, filter wheel here will connect directly to the camera. So it driver, its driver connects through the camera and the filter wheel sort of at the same time. And then they work in unison, which is nice. Up here, I'm currently running the QHY 200M as the guide camera, which goes into a ZWO helical focuser which is a bit of a nicety. I really use it like a spacer, not really as a focuser, but it is nice to be able to refocus without uh, rotating the camera. That's what Helical does. Then it's got its own little spacer off the off-axis guide adapter here, and that's the Celestron off-axis guider. Now connecting the camera to the filter wheel, I used a little bit of a adapter here, I believe, so that I could unscrew the camera at any time. There is a method where you can screw the camera directly to the filter wheel and you save a little bit of back focal distance here, which is nice, but then it's really difficult to actually take the camera off and clean it. If you get dust motes or anything like that, you have to undo the whole rig. Whereas with this, I can unscrew it, make my adjustments, clean it, and screw it back in again, which is fine. We have a little spacer here just to reach focus and the various adapters required to make that happen. The good thing about this setup as well is that I can change rotation. Obviously you've got to redo your flats when that happens, but I can unscrew these screws on this side and change the rotation here, or I can unscrew these screws on this side and change the rotation of the guide scope and the whole image train all at once. And that's where you would do the rotation. It's configured so it sits above the frame. It goes to the, I'll put a diagram up to show you what I mean, but you want the guide camera to be not in the way of the actual chip itself. So all the rotation happens here because these two are aligned nicely and I'll rotate my image 
depending on the target there. So as you can see, I've got a lot of Celestron stuff here. Here's another one. This is the F7 reducer for the Edge HD 11 inch. And that works quite well. Um, there is a, a little bit of coma in the corners, but not much. It's not very noticeable. And this bad boy here is the ZWO EAF focuser, the second version. So it doesn't require extra power, I don't believe. Or well, this might be the first version that does. I've got a power remote and then the actual cable to the computer itself. But the cool thing about this is that it has this Schmidt Cassegrain bracket here. It really just twiddles the knob for you. Uh, my main issue with this is probably the backlash. It's got quite a big backlash value. And that makes it hard to configure in your software. The software can compensate for it, but it requires a little bit of tuning to sort of get it right. And even I don't have the autofocus 100% right. I am curious as to whether the Q focuser, which has a much better backlash profile, they claim zero. I don't think it could ever be zero, especially with a bracket. Um, QHY doesn't have the bracket yet, so it remains to be seen. Uh, I will test the QHY out when that happens, but for now the ZWO focuser has been a godsend, especially if you're running a Schmidt Cassegrain or a RAS or something like that. And you want to put that focus there on the knob instead of putting it in here in the image train and losing some space. Because you can see I don't have a lot of space left. After the filter wheel and the off-axis guider, there really isn't a lot of space to uh, space out with the spacers. So that's the telescope itself. The only other things I can show you in here are the control box, which Sidereal Trading put together for me, which is fantastic. So you can switch power on and off to things if you need. It's got a hub. I have a web camera there so I can see the observatory from the side, but also I put a second web camera on the floor. It does allow me to see clouds as well, but also um, just generally the position of the telescope from below, which is great. Other than that, a whole bunch of crap on the floor, which I don't think about very much because I don't come in here very much. Um, I like to put the garbage bags over the power generally. So just in case there is any leak in here, uh, water will roll off but the dehumidifier will run all the time to get the moisture out of the observatory. Uh, but that doesn't help, of course, when it's full on raining, which it is today. So there is some moisture in here, but like I say, there's no leaks for this observatory, which is good. Everything is pretty well sealed. And that's about it, really. And this setup has allowed me to get some excellent images. I'm particularly happy with the Cosmic Bat this year, uh, but a few old favorites as well, M8. What else did I do? Oh, the um, Centaurus A Galaxy was a really nice one as well. So yeah, really happy with this season's work and going deeper and doing longer exposures. But the planets are rolling around now, so I am very tempted to reconfigure this image train for planets. And that will mean pulling down all of this. I'll probably take the whole thing off in one big lump and wrap it up so that I can put it back on uh, when I'm ready to do DSO work again. But for now, I'll probably go prime focus. I'm gonna put the QHY 678M planetary camera on here. And I don't think I'm gonna use the 2.5X PowerMate because I think the resolution is big enough that I could get it, I can zoom in anyway, but that remains to be seen, I'll test that. I've seen far more complicated setups than mine. I think for an observatory situation where I can go ham on all this stuff, uh, this is actually pretty modest. There's not much to it, but everything is electronically automated. It is windy today. Um, you know, even in this sort of wind, I can still image with this, with this observatory setup because the shutter opens this way and it kind of blocks the wind from every angle, which has been really great. I really don't let the windy nights keep me from imaging. Uh, of course, if it's a hurricane or something like that, then the observatory will be closed. But I remember seeing a picture of an old man in a Sky and Telescope magazine with his rig. And I saw all these cables and it looked like a spaceship to me. And I thought, I want to be that guy. I want to be that old guy. So yes, I'll probably add more things. But right now, automated mount, automated focusing, automated filters, automated go-to. I don't come in here. And when I came in before, I noticed that the, I was filming and I noticed the glass was so horrible. I just had to um, clean that up. And that's the shutter closing by itself. Uh, when it comes down, it automatically, the magnets connect these two charging cables and it go, it's good to go again. 
And as long as the dome doesn't catch anything as it's rotating in the night time, it will always return to this position, which is great. Uh, but I do like to check on it. If there was one feedback I'd give to Next Dome, it, was, it would be to make the driver for this. I don't know if you can do it in ASCOM, but if it's detected that you've closed the dome and this is not charging, it needs to send you an email or a notification or something because otherwise this battery just drains itself and you've got to take the whole thing apart and put a new battery in, which I've done at least six times. Well, that's about it for this video. Um, do you have any questions about this setup? Uh, is this similar to yours? I don't have to be using a Schmidt Cassegrain. I just love the journey with the Schmidt Cassegrains and the stuff that I'm pulling out because they are slow telescopes, but I have a lot of time and I can do this night after night after night. So I'm happy to gather that data and get that really long focal length, which is great. Remember, you can buy any of this stuff from High Point Scientific. So if you see something in this video that matches the use case for your particular observatory or portable setup, head over to High Point Scientific. They're a New Jersey vendor, but they ship anywhere in the world. They have a price match guarantee and they fully support their equipment. And they've been supporting this channel for a long time. I really appreciate their support. And I do get a lot of feedback from you guys who have gone out and bought things from High Point and it's always really positive feedback. So happy to have them on the channel. That's about it. I hope you enjoyed this little rig rundown. Let me know if you have any questions about any of this equipment and I hope your astrophotography journey is going well. My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you've been watching Star Stuff. And remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. <laughs>